Here I'm going to continue to go through the derivation of how we figure out, based on these experimental results, what our x spin states are. Now, from these measurements, we get these constraints on the coefficients, which are describing these x spin up and spin down states. Now, the next step is trying to actually figure out what they are. Now, you might just say, oh, each one of them is 1 over square root of 2. Well, the problem is, if you do that, then these states would actually look the same. And remember that this could be plus or minus 1 over the square root of 2. But it actually gets more complicated than that in that these are complex numbers. So let me just show you what's going on here. Again, some of you might be able to see that this is trivially true. For others of you, this might be a very new idea. So let's take the number or variable k. And let's say that k is equal to um, n e to the i, um, and I'm going to choose theta. And so this is a way of representing complex numbers. And the idea here is that we're going to call this a phase. And the reason that I'm writing it out this way is that we can then ask what the magnitude k squared is equal to. So again, we've learned that this can be written as k star k. So the first thing I'm going to do is take my k and complex conjugate it. Now, if I've written it this way, I can say that n is going to be a real positive number. So it's real and positive because it's phase. The extent to which it's negative or imaginary is captured in this number. So we're effectively calling this the phase. And so if I assume that this is true, that it takes this form, k star is going to be n e to the negative i theta. And the reason we say that is, again, if we say that n is a real and positive number, then when we complex conjugate it, we still just have n. Then the phase, remember, when we complex conjugate, we take anything that's an i and make it negative i. No difference when it's in this sort of a form. And then k itself is our original number, n e to the positive i theta. So now we multiply these two together. And you see you have n times n, which is going to be n squared. And then we have e to the negative i theta, e to the positive i theta. Now there's a few different ways to, to look at this. And you might just happen to know off the top of your head that when you have e to the negative number multiplied by e to the positive number, that in fact is going to equal 1. So another way to think through this, if, if mathematically that's something you're not very familiar with, is that whenever you multiply numbers that share a base and but then have um, so this this base here but then you have different exponents we can add them together so that's like e to the negative i theta plus i theta well so what is this negative i theta plus i theta is zero so we could write this as magnitude of k squared is equal to n squared e to the zero what is e to the zero it's just one so we get here that it's n squared so the reason I've worked through this is to show you that, in fact, if we know that k squared equals n squared, that doesn't tell you that k is just equal to n. We actually need to write it in general as a complex number as this real n with this phase. So this is the general way to write it. So what this means is up here, where you have, for instance, magnitude a squared is 1 half, how we should be writing this then is that we can think about this, okay, is going to be 1 over square root of 2 e to the i alpha, 1 over square root of 2 e to the negative i alpha, right? So that will also give us 1 half, but now we've captured this complex term. So in a separate video, I'll go through the final way that we go through and um, make this argument and actually figure out what all of these are equal to.